Good morning. That's just a little bit of a taste of um, the work in India, an overview of what I'm involved with there. I'm heading off to India on the, um, the 9th of February, and um, we'll be there for a few weeks, visit all those places, all those people that you saw. Um, and um, yeah, I visit India about, about, last year I was three times, probably get there two or three times again this year for about a month at a time. Um, visiting that work, and the work is expanding and increasing, and um, with that comes opposition, but God's doing amazing things. Um, so that is part of what I'm involved with, other nations as well. So those of you who are supporting us and praying for us in this church, this, this part of what you do, um, although you may not physically go yourself through your prayers and through involvement with me, I go representing this church as um, very much carry you with me as I go. So thank you very much for your support and um, prayers and all those things. We cherish those. So um, yeah, so exciting to see what's happening in, around the world. Something exciting as well, you wouldn't believe this though, you saw on that video a place called Naxalbari, that is right on the India-Nepal border. Um, nine months ago, we had a guy from Nepal come to our church um, and say, oh, can we rent your facilities? Uh, we said no, but you've, because they're just this fellowship group, and we said no, but if you want to join us, you're more than welcome to. So, um, Today in Cairns, they're announcing that that whole group of um, Nepali groups who are originally from Bhutan, who came to Australia as refugees, are now going to be joining our church in Cairns, um, which is very exciting for us in Cairns for the growth of the church. But what's more exciting for me is that they, the refugee camp and the, um, where they're from is just a 30-minute ride by motorbike from our church base in Naxalbari. Um, so in February when I'm there, their leader will come across and meet with me and Pastor Barry about the possibility of us actually having their, some of the young people come to our Bible school in Siliguri and then having um, potentially, who knows, starting CRC work in, um, in Nepal in years to come. So amazing, absolutely amazing. Like The interesting thing is two weeks before they turned up, I prayed, God, we're a small church in Cairns that we, I go to, um, but I said, God, we would like to have some more people from um, another nationality. We ministered to Papua New Guineans, but is there another nationality or group of people in, um, in Cairns that we can connect with? I had other my, in other ideas, but this was, I couldn't have imagined the scenario that, we've, that um, God's brought our way. So uh, yesterday at their fellowship, it was announced that they're going to be coming in and being part of our Cairns church. And then um, today in our service in Cairns, the rest of the congregation will find out. So it's been a nine-month journey for us, but it's very exciting. It's going to cause chaos for us and a mess and a whole heap of work, but uh, we're excited. Um, and I'm even more excited because I get to go away for six months and leave it with others to, to sort out. So, um, yeah, so also... Summer of gratefulness, very grateful um, as a family. My uh, oldest son, James, some of you know him, remember him when he was born or running around like this. He's just turned 18, uh, finished his year 12. Um, so that means I'm a father of an adult, can't believe that. Um, yeah, so yeah, the gray hairs prove it though, but that's all right. Um, but very grateful to this church um, that in three weeks' time, he's going to come down here and be able to come here and be part of the church here and flow in and stuff like that. So very, very grateful to the Lord of just how he works things. James wanted to get out of Cairns and uh, wanted to, wants to be a teacher, so he's going to Tabor, um, doing the teaching degree there, attending church here and serving in the life of the church here. So he's just so excited. So uh, very grateful to all of you that you'll embrace him and include him, but very grateful to the Lord that he's just got a, a church home to come to where he knows a whole heap of people, got support, um, and being able to, to come and serve here. So, uh, yeah, so very excited for that. So it's a change for us. So you'll see Sondra in a few weeks' time. Um, she'll be here coming down on the 31st of January um, and here for a week just to get James settled and then heading back on the 7th of February so I can fly to India on the 9th. Um, so we pass in the... Yeah, that is life. That is our life. And then, um, yeah, next two weeks' time, we're going up to Papua New Guinea, Sondra and I, for a wedding. Uh, one of our young staff up... Well, he's not so young, one of our single staff up there is getting married, um, which is very exciting. We've had a lot to do with him. So he's, he's, he's 40, so he's actually getting married now. So, um, but he's part of, part of our family and part of our staff up there, so it's very exciting. John, are you laughing? Is that John Zumas there? No, it's not John Zumas, sorry. Sorry, Louis. I thought you were John Zumas. I thought John was laughing, those who know John. <laughs> always happy. God bless you. Good to be happy. Well, we can be truly grateful, hey? Isn't it great to be grateful? Love the idea of your, your theme this, this month, the summer of gratitude. And we're going to look at that. So easy to be 
the opposite. So easy to be ungrateful. And I had one of these moments um, on Thursday when I was flying down. Um, I arrived at the airport in Adelaide um, to go and pick up my bag. And um, my bag didn't come out first. And I have gold membership with Virgin, so um, because I travel a lot, that's just part of one of the benefits of traveling all the time that I get it for free. So priority baggage means that your bag comes out first. That's reasonable to expect, isn't it? Um, So I'm waiting and waiting and thinking priority baggage means your bag comes out first. So I'm getting a little bit... And the number of people at the carousel is leading less and less and less. And I'm getting more and more ungrateful and more and more thinking, why is my bag not out yet? Um, And I'm coming up with my long list of arguments about what I'm going to say to Virgin and how I'm going to... When they send me an email saying, how was your trip and how was our service, I was had it all lined up to the point that I actually, when I picked up my bag, I counted how many were behind it. So it was six last. Um, Very ungrateful, hey. Um, And then I really just had this thought, on Sunday you're going to be preaching about gratitude. (laughs) So I had to change my attitude and I said, Lord, Lord, thank you for the wonderful pumpkin soup and the time I had, the lattes I had with my wife at the Virgin Lounge in Cairns before we left and the fact that I got priority boarding and priority this and priority that. Um, So I just had to switch my thinking. But it's so easy, isn't it, to become ungrateful. So easy just to let little things spoil so much that is a delight to us. Well, gratitude and having it as part of our life makes life sweet. If we have an attitude where we're growing in gratitude, we're living a life of gratitude, it makes life sweet, it makes it a joy And um, we become truly alive. Without gratitude, we can't truly enjoy the fullness that God has for us for this life. Because the opposite of gratitude is ungratefulness and being grumpy and cranky and miserable and bitter. And all those sorts of things start to set in. So we need to be people who are grateful. And when we are grateful, it brings us into the greatness of God. Draws us right into His greatness and who He is. John Piper says that um, pleasure is a measure of the treasure that we've found in Christ. You know, to to take pleasure in Christ is to really be grateful. And when we can be grateful and the level of gratefulness we find and the level of pleasure we take in Christ really shows us how much Jesus is a treasure to us. So if we're not expressing that pleasure, if we're not looking at Him with gratitude probably a sign that we've lost him as our treasure. We've lost focus on him of the treasure that we have inside of Jesus Christ. So let's keep him as our treasure. We're looking at God is higher. And when I say God, for many of us, we have a picture of what that means. But I want to be a little bit more specific because when I say God in India, that can mean the cow that's sitting in the middle of the highway that you have to actually drive around. Um, It can be the monkeys in the trees, it can be the snakes, it can be all sorts of things. Uh, So when we say God, and even here in Australia, God can mean many different things. So I want to be a little bit more specific than just saying God. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the one that the Hebrew writers say is the image of God, is the the reveals uh, reveals God to us. We're talking about the one when Peter preached and said to the Jews, that you guys killed the author of life, and he was referring to Jesus Christ. Talking about who John, the Apostle John, who wrote and talked about um, this Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. It's that Jesus that we're talking about. He's the one that the angels said, you'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. When I say God, that's who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. So being grateful for the fact that he is higher, In Hebrews chapter 1, there's a passage, and we'll look at a couple of scriptures from there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, we'll read it in a minute. But the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of people who um, had come to Christ, loved Jesus, had been along that journey for a period of time, and now we're starting to just get a little bit confused. We're starting to add extra to Jesus. You know, when we add extra to Jesus, I think it's a sign of, or it shows that we're We're not grateful for the fullness that we have in him. So these people, they started to value angels. 
and put the, the visitation of angels above Jesus. They put the, the writings and the words and the life of Abraham, Moses, Joshua, above the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. The old, the religious systems of the Old Testament and the old Jewish religions were becoming more important to them. Their religious systems were becoming more important to them than Jesus Christ himself. The old covenant that they had, they were, putting their faith, they were going back to putting their faith in that rather than the new covenant that they'd found in Jesus Christ. They were starting to go back to putting their faith in a day, the Sabbath, rather than Jesus Christ being their Sabbath. So they'd started to add extra. They'd started to put things in. That Jesus Christ wasn't enough for them anymore. And the writer of Hebrews comes to them and just blows it all out of the water. And he's writing to them to prove to them and show them that all these other things that they were putting their hope and trust in were insignificant compared to the sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. So that's the starting point. So let's read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. It says, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. So he's acknowledging that. God's supposed to speak to us through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. So Jesus is above the prophets. He spoke to us in the prophets before, but now he spoke to us through his very own son. And it says, God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. Wow. Everything. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. Everything is Christ. Man, that makes him the boss. That puts him in charge of everything. The heavens and the earth are under him. Everything on this planet belongs to him. That means you and me, we are also his. There's no higher place. There's no higher place of authority than to have everything under, owning everything, is there? Donald Trump and... Maybe others think that they are in the highest place, but my Jesus, he's in a higher place. He's a higher authority above all sorts of people, anything, any systems or governments placed on this earth. My Jesus Christ is higher. Everything is his, including you. And through the the sun, he created the universe. Through the sun, God created the universe. Man, he's powerful. There's no one more powerful. There's no higher power than Jesus Christ who's, who was there at the creation, was part of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Those stars that you admire at night, the moon, the sun, all of that, Jesus Christ created those. There's no higher power. And he is the one that wants to be involved in your life. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. This is our Jesus. He radiates the glory of God. He expresses the very character of God. He is God himself, our Jesus. Hallelujah. And he sustains everything by his mighty power of his command. By his word, everything is sustained. If he stops speaking his word over this planet, this planet stops. You You and me, we're gone. We might think we're important, we might think we're significant, we might think we control things and we have everything organized and we have our life sorted or we have our business running well, and we have all these things in order. But it'll just take Jesus Christ to stop speaking and then chaos will reign. It will all come to an end. Oh, there's no higher power. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Now he is seated at the right hand of the Father in that high place, in that special place. Nobody else can have that place. Not the angels. Nobody else gets to sit there. Not Moses, not Abraham, no religious leader. Jesus Christ himself, that place was reserved for him and him alone. That's where he is seated. This is the one that we worship. This is the one that we honor. This is the one that we're singing about as our cornerstone and lifting up his name today. The one who sits at the very in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, in a position of power and authority. Wow. This shows that the Son is far greater than angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than theirs. 
There's no other name that is greater than the name of Jesus Christ. Wow, isn't that awesome? That passage says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Let me just very quickly try and explain why that is a great benefit to you and I and why we can be so grateful that he is seated in that place. In Genesis, when God created the heavens and earth, it said that God finished the work on the sixth day. He said, it's awesome, it's great, it's fantastic, done a great job. And then on the seventh day, he rested because his work was finished. So it's almost like God just sat on the seventh day because the work was complete. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He can sit like God sits because the work is done and complete. But it goes on. Ephesians tells us that you and I are now seated inside of Christ. So the work of Adam and sin and sickness and all of those things were dealt with in Jesus Christ. He's done the work and finished with them. Our sin problem is done with. That's why he's seated. If he hadn't finished the work, he wouldn't be seated. So he's seated at the right hand of the Father because his work is finished. So his work of dealing with your sin problem, it's done. The work of dealing with your sickness is done. That's why he can sit. But you and I get to sit inside of him. So for us to have that outworking of the righteousness of Christ in us, overcoming the work of Adam in us, that sin nature in us, what do we need to do? We don't need to add more to Jesus. We need to learn to sit in him and rest in him because the work is already done for us. But so many of us are getting religious. So many of us think we need to do all these things to get the work done, to make ourselves more holy, to get us right with God. That's a lie. That's religion. All we need to do is trust in Jesus Christ, learning to rest in him, learning to be grateful for the fullness of his work and to rest in him. Hallelujah. It's true, but so often we so struggle with it. And maybe you're like me, I'm an activist. I like to get things done. I like to do stuff. And unless I'm doing something, um, I feel like I'm being very unproductive. So I've had to learn how to slow down and actually in this area of my life say, Jesus, you're it. Um, I need to rest in you. I need to learn to sit in you. And we can be so grateful for that. In John chapter 6, there's a um, verse 41 to 43, talks about... Jesus is talking about many things, but he, in this passage, he comes to the disciples and then there's an extended crowd that are there. So it's not just the 12, there's this large crowd there um, and they're grumbling and complaining. Jesus is doing miracles, he's feeding the 5,000, he's doing all these things, but they still found something to grumble about and complain about. And Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the bread of life. I've come from heaven. And their response is this, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? How can Jesus, you say that you came from heaven and we know who your father is? We know you when you were little. We saw you grow up. You can't tell us that you're from heaven. In fact, we know that your mum and your dad, and we know that your mum was pregnant before she was married to your dad. So you're actually an illegitimate child. So don't tell us you're from heaven. Don't tell us that you're God. Don't tell us those things. We don't accept that. And then Jesus told them to stop grumbling. But they continued. And if you read the, the rest of John 6, it talks about how many, many, many people left Jesus at that time because they refused to eat of Christ. They refused to accept that he was the bread of life. He, they refused to accept who he was. And they couldn't be grateful that Jesus Christ was right there in their midst. They, they couldn't be grateful that God was right there with them. They couldn't accept it. So they rejected it. In Numbers chapter 11, there's a story about um, manna from heaven. And further in John 6, Jesus says, I am manna from heaven. And said, your ancestors used to eat this manna that came from heaven. And they got hungry again. But if you eat of me, you'll never go hungry. I'll satisfy your every need. I am God. I can do that. But in Numbers 11, um, the story that Jesus was referring to is that the, the Israelites were in the desert. 
and there's no food in the desert. So God every day provided them manna, basically a bread from heaven that they collected up every day. Enough for that day, they collected it. And on the sixth day, they collected a double portion so they had enough for the Sabbath so they didn't have to go out again. But every day for 40 years, that manna from heaven was provided for them. Perfect provision from heaven. Everything they needed, perfect protein, nutrients, vitamins, everything. For the lactose intolerant, it was fine for them. Those who had health, other eating concerns, it was all perfect for them. It's beautiful. But the Israelites found a way to grumble and complain. And in verse 4, uh, is it verse 4? Uh, yeah, verse 4, it says that they want to eat meat. And then verse 5 says, well, we remember back in Egypt when we had fish and we had melons and we had cucumber and we had onions and we had garlic and they're reminiscing about what they used to eat in the old life thinking how awesome is that and then they're saying now we've lost our appetite we've lost our appetite because all we see every day is manna and I think in one sense fair enough for 40 years I wouldn't be wanting to eat the same thing but as a picture of Christ there's a picture going on here that they weren't satisfied with what God was providing for them. Every day they saw a miracle, but they weren't satisfied with it. They wanted something extra. They weren't grateful for what God was providing for them day after day after day. You know, the, Jesus Christ is our perfect provision. They'd lost their appetite. They'd lost their hunger for this same thing. You know, as Christians, we need to make sure we don't lose our appetite for our per perfect provision from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. He is perfect. He is there. I want to just encourage you, if you have felt like you've lost your appetite, and you say, oh, Lord, I want to be hungry again. And I can tell you, I'll get your hunger back, but that's quite hard to do, actually. The only way I know is to actually discipline myself to get into the Word, to do my daily Bible readings, and that hunger for Christ and His Word just grows and grows. But it, quite often, it starts with forgetting about my feelings and just making a deliberate choice. I'm going to do this day after day after day. I'm going to feed on the Word, I'm going to feed on Christ, and then the appetite comes back. The hunger and the passion for the food comes. So if you're not doing your daily Bible reading, I'm not here to judge you or make you feel bad. I don't want you to do a resolution. I want you just to say, God, I'm doing this. And if you miss a day, God bless you and just get on with the next day. Don't beat up on yourself. Just move on to the next day, day after day, feeding yourself on Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus is our perfect provision from heaven. And in that passage, the Israelites really lost their perspective because they allowed ungratefulness to determine their perspective. You know, gratitude influences our perspective on life. When we're grateful, we can look back at the past and see how it really was. We can enjoy the moment that we're in and it can be so sweet and it gives us hope for the future. But when we're ungrateful, we look back at the past and we change it and we distort it. They look back at the past, the Israelites look back at the past and made it look so much better than it was. Because the truth was, they were under bondage, they were in slavery, they were crying out to God to rescue them. They'd just been rescued and saved and brought out of all of that. And then they're looking back and saying, oh no, it was better back there. And it's not true, but they were, ungratefulness changed their perspective on the past. Gratitude influences our perspective on the past, the present, and the future. People who are grateful are the most op optimistic people in life. They look at that proverbial glass of water and say, man, it's my glass, it's there, it's awesome, and they drink of their, their half a glass of water. The ungrateful will say, well, who took my top off? Who nicked off with it? Why don't, who's got that? Why don't I get that? Where's the rest of it? Why didn't you fill it up enough? But gratitude appreciates what we have. The Apostle Paul wrote that um, true godliness with contentment is great wealth or great gain. If we can learn to be content, and to be content, you need to be grateful, appreciating what God has provided for you, what God has given to you. The Israelites have lost that, this perfect provision from heaven. You and I have a perfect provision for heaven, from heaven that we need to, even in the hard times, they were going through a hard time, the Israelites, but even in those hard times, we can look to that perfect provision and allow it to satisfy us. 
as I was just reflecting and praying as we were worshiping, I just felt that there's somebody here that business-wise, you've lost money, significant amounts of money. It's not a little bit. You've lost some significant amounts of money due to the changing environment and business and things like that. And God is saying, will you, will you still be satisfied in me, even in the midst of financial you dipping? You thought everything was set up, you were secure, and now that's being shaken. And God is saying, will you still be satisfied with me, even in the midst of financial insecurity? Will you still be satisfied in me when in sickness? Not accepting that sickness, saying, Jesus, I believe that you are the perfect provision that can bring me healing. But sometimes that healing doesn't come as quick as we want. But will you still remain satisfied in him? Will you still remain hungry for Christ in the middle of disappointment or discouragement or unanswered prayers? Late last year, we had a, a lady from Papua New Guinea and her husband fly down to Cairns, a, a medivac out of PNG. He'd had an aneurysm on the brain. Uh, we met them at the airport as soon as they came from, sorry, met them at the hospital that, as they came from the airport, praying that God would do a miracle. Three days later, he passed away. God didn't come through with a miracle. So then we had to try and talk his wife through, this Filipino lady, about how God is still good in the midst. Will you still be, appreciate the perfect provision of Jesus Christ, even when things didn't work out the way that you expected? Will you still be grateful for who he is, even when things seem out of control? Even at work, you might have a grumpy, cranky boss. I hope you're not the grumpy, cranky boss. Um, but maybe you have a grumpy, cranky boss. Um, but my Jesus is higher than your grumpy, cranky boss. Can you still find a place of gratitude in that? When you've got work colleagues who are, don't operate under the same systems and rules and standards that you have. And maybe they don't, you know, don't hold the same values as you do of honor, integrity, speaking the truth. But can you still in that place be grateful to Jesus Christ? not get consumed with ungratefulness and bitterness. It's so easy. As I said at the start, it's so easy to be ungrateful. It's cheap. It's easy. It's the road that is easy to travel. Oh, hallelujah. Facebook and social media is a really good way of becoming discontent. Because we look through it and people put up their, their, their highlights of their life and you're flicking through and you're looking at the fact that the... Look at their perfect kids sitting in a row, smiling, their house is tidy. You look up, you look around your house that is in chaos, an absolute mess, and you sort of think, man, they've got the life, but look at my life. Or we see all these people that are traveling on holidays all over the place and they're going, well, I'm stuck here in my job. Very easy. Facebook promised that we would be more connected, more relational, more this, but the research actually shows that it's actually causing high levels of discontent, high levels of depression and anxiety and comparing going on. The other thing Facebook does is that you look on Facebook and you see all your friends are out for a coffee and you're thinking, why didn't they invite me? Why am I not included? Why did they do that? You're laughing very hard, so I think that um, you all understand. Um, but it causes us to become very discontent in life and what's going on around us. Uh, what's your Facebook usage? I'm on Facebook, use it all the time. Um, but watch your, what it's doing to you, the way it's impacting your thinking and your psyche and your mindset. Hallelujah. Yeah. A couple of other areas where we need to still be, well, we quite often in our society, we're tested about whether we're grateful. One is in the area of singleness. Are you still grateful even when you're single? Maybe you've been praying for a partner for a long time and you haven't got your answer or it just hasn't worked out for you. But can you still be grateful to Jesus Christ, the one who is your perfect provision from heaven? Oh, there's many opportunities in life to be, great, to be ungrateful, but we need to continue to develop an attitude of gratefulness because it changes our perspective on everything. In Psalms 113, verse 5 to 9, there's this wonderful psalm, and um, I know you're reading through the psalms at the moment, so we'll just read this to, to come to a close. It says, How can, uh, sorry, Who can compare with the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high? And the answer is nobody. No one. Nothing. 
Nothing compares to how great our God is, who is throned on high. And quite often when we think God's up there and we think of kings and queens and people on their throne, we see them as distant and far off and unapproachable. But let me tell you, the next verse is very encouraging. He says, He stoops to look down on heaven and earth. He lifts the poor from the dust. Maybe you feel poor or an area of your life where you're in poverty or an area of your life that isn't working out as you'd hoped. He looks down, he comes down and wants to lift you out of that. And the needy from the garbage dump. I don't think any of you live on the garbage dumps of literally. But the trash piles of life, the trash piles of the disappointments of life, the discouragements of life, the the hopelessness of life. Jesus Christ comes to that and lifts us out of it. He sets them among princes, even the princes of his own people. He gives the childless woman a family and making her a happy mother. Wow. And in Philippians 2, if you read that one, it talks about how Jesus came down from heaven to earth And that God then exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. And we sang it earlier that at at his name, every knee will bow. And in that process, that is God stooping down from heaven to earth to deal with your sin problem and my sin problem. And saying, I come down, took your sin upon myself, dealt with that so you don't have to deal with it on your own. Jesus Christ stooped down. uh, David wrote, that God, you stooped down to make me great. You stooped down to me, a little boy out in the middle of nowhere, a little shepherd boy. You came into my life and lifted me up into greatness. He realized it wasn't his skill, his talent, his ability that got him to that place. It was God's work in his life who came down and lifted him up. Man, David was so grateful for what God had done in his life. Are you grateful? It's a summer of gratitude. Let's be people of gratitude. It changes your perspective on everything. And we've got a heck of a lot to be grateful for, for Jesus Christ and his awesome provision to us as our healer, as our provider, as our saviour. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Jesus, I just thank you that you are not a distant God and far away, that you came from heaven, you stooped down into our life to lift us up out of poverty out of our sinfulness, out of our own weakness. And Lord, as you lifted us up, you seated us with you. And Father, I pray that each one of us will learn to rest in you, learn to sit in you, because the work is done. Our salvation is secure. Our healing is set in you. All that is done and all that you needed to do, your perfect provision is dealt with on the cross. And now you are sitting. You are no longer working because you've finished your work. And that we're, Lord, we need to learn to rest in that. But we are so grateful, Father, that your Son allows us to rest in Him. And we thank you that you are higher, that you are above, that you are the greatest, that there's no one above you. And Lord, we choose to be grateful today, fixing our eyes on you and developing an attitude of gratefulness. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.